but at this point I get to say good afternoon. Can't say good morning anymore, and welcome to the second of the presentations in this whole series. One of the things that uh, I always find interesting is being the media and public relations guy for ARL is you never know exactly what's going to cross your desk as a news story at different points. And one of the nice parts was that I'm reading this strange news story about this neat young lady who gets an acceptance letter from MIT and then launches it into space. And I'm going, what? <laughs> uh, we've got media hits and hams do interesting things, but launching your acceptance letter into near space, is, is that, that got my attention. So I had to learn a little bit more about her, and I have been very, very impressed with that which I have read. So I'd like to introduce to you Erin King. And Erin will be talking and discussing about some of the ways in which we can use high-altitude balloons, amateur radio, and if those of you sitting here, I know hams like to find out uh, how do we interest schools, how do we get involved with schools, and how do you get involved with youth. This is a neat way to do it. So Erin, over to you. is AK4JG. I forgot to put it up there, sorry. And I'm going to talk about high altitude ballooning, as he said, which I include cool stuff. Radios are cool, but we put some other cool things in the packages that go into near space, too. So, uh, Amateur radio high altitude ballooning is what some people also call the poor man's space program. It's uh, well, no, well known for being a thing that people do to get really pretty pictures of the curve of the earth and we have I've been in a group for several years that sends uh, payloads into near space and those include cameras as well as some other things and they travel up to about 70,000 to 120,000 feet which is in a zone of the stratosphere called near space and High altitude ballooning has gotten some more recognition recently because of some viral videos online, one of which was mine, which I'll talk about later. So I first got involved, as I said, with a research group at my school called DREAMS, which stands for Doing Research at Extreme Altitudes by Motivated Students. And this is in Columbus, Georgia, at Columbus High School. And I got my ham radio license so that I could become a part of this group. And I've become, I've since become more involved in other aspects of ham radio as well. So what flies on a high altitude balloon mission is a regular latex weather balloon and a parachute and then the payload includes a tracking equipment, cameras, and some scientific experiments and other things. And the balloon is usually between 800 and 1200 grams, at least those are the sizes that my group has flown in the past, but it varies based on how far you want the balloon to go and how high you want it to go, as well as the weight of the packages that you'll be flying. And the trackers, usually we use APRS as our primary tracker. In fact, we've always used APRS as our primary tracker. Usually we use it as a secondary as well. You have to have redundant systems to make sure that if one of the trackers fails, you'll still be able to find the payload when it lands. And the APRS systems send out GPS coordinates as well as altitude so we can keep track of how high it is and when it starts descending when we're chasing it. And uh, sometimes we use a satellite transmitter called a spot as our secondary and we sometimes even include a tertiary system just to be sure and that's just an animal tracker um, that just sends out a beacon on a certain frequency and you can track it using a Yagi you know you've seen on the cartoons where people like go like this with an antenna and it beeps faster when you get closer it actually does that and we put cameras on the balloons or on the payload so that they take nice pictures and the camera that I used for my most recent launch was a GoPro and we have to make sure that the SD cards that we put in the cameras have enough memory to go for the entire flight and the last one I flew we just put 16 gigs in there to be sure and we fly video cameras we have to make sure that they're not going to like automatically stop after a certain amount of time so we have to 
find specific types of cameras that will do that and that will also take pictures every few seconds continuously until you tell it to stop and it won't just take like a hundred and then stop because that's not nearly enough. So some, some examples of some scientific experiments that we've flown in our packages before. Uh, one of the main things that we always fly is a sensor package, which includes a thermometer, a relative humidity sensor, absolute pressure sensor, UV light or radiation sensor, and a CO2 level sensor. And my teacher, who's the mentor of this group, is always adding new sensors to this package that we fly on the balloons. Um, one of the most recent experiments that we flew was a bunch of different types of algae, just to see how it would react in the extreme atmosphere. And my teacher was actually invited by a group at NASA to do a little bit of research, like low budget research on some effects that uh, would be seen on water on Mars. So we actually flew some water and then water as a control and then some different solutions uh, to see what types of salts would maybe lower the freezing temperature or raise the freezing temperature of water, which we would see the effect of on Mars because they found some of these compounds on the Martian surface. And I just threw in uh, recently my teacher, um, he was participating with a group from California with an elementary school group and they challenged them to build a payload to add on to our balloon flight and one of the students decided to fly a cockroach and it survived the flight and some other students flew some flies and they died. <laughs> so, fun fact. Um, before every launch, we, ha we have to do a lot of preparation and a bunch of ground tests before the actual mission begins. We always put together, like if we have some new experiments that we want to add to the payload, we have to put those together and add them to the payload. And then we usually will have to rebuild some things that were damaged in previous missions as well. And we all put, we put the boxes and the parachutes all together with rope and we hang it up. We usually hang it up in the gymnasium at our school to make sure that nothing is uh, crooked or nothing falls apart when we actually fly it. Um, and we have to prepare the balloon in an interesting way. To prepare the balloon to put on this piece of PVC when we inflate it, we put an empty spool of thread in the, no in the nozzle of the balloon and we wrap it with rope and duct tape and make it really tight to make sure that it's not going to uh, collapse during the flight. And we have to prepare the ground station computers as well. We have to install the necessary software for mapping the packets that we'll receive from the balloon on the transmitter. And we have to configure them with a GPS in the car, a TNC and a radio, and make sure that they're all working correctly before we do the actual launch um, so that we can make sure that we'll be receiving packets from the balloon to track it. And and we always do a prediction of the flight path before we fly to kind of see where we need to be to land in the region that we want to land in. I have a picture here, if you can see it. The blue line is before the burst, and then the red line is after the burst. And the circle, there's two circles on that end, which are basically where it's going to land. And we use this algorithm online to decide where we're going to launch it from based on where it lands. And we want it to land in those white regions because that's like farmland and fields. We don't want it to land in all the green or it'll probably get stuck in a tree. Um, so we have to do a bunch of research ahead of time and see how are the wind patterns going. Uh, and this algorithm that, that we use online is very good at, at using actually weather patterns from airports in the region to determine uh, the flight path that it'll probably take. Um, we also have to rent gas and the group that I've worked with in the past usually use hel uses helium which is sensible uh, but we have used hydrogen twice and hydrogen is of course you know explosive flammable so we uh, usually have adults like who are trained to do so handle the hydrogen and um, it's actually beneficial because it's much cheaper than helium. Recently though hydrogen has gone up in price so we started using helium again um, and on my most recent one I used helium. And then finally we'll choose a launch site and we'll be ready to go. And on launch day 
we have to prepare the payload by setting it out on a tarp, and we make sure that all all of the ropes and everything are attached, and the parachute is attached. But we don't connect it to the balloon until it's f filled. Uh, before we start filling the balloon, we change all the batteries and everything that's going to be flying: the cameras, the trackers, the radios. Make sure that everything is charged and won't die. We turn the trackers on, and we make sure that we're receiving packets in our vehicles before we start anything, just to make sure that everything is still working even after we've done testing on the ground. And uh, if we are flying data loggers that have sensors or experiments, we'll start those as well. And then we start filling the balloon, and we check the lift actually with a uh, fish scale. You know how people like weigh their fish with a fish scale? We turn it upside down um, and weigh the lift. We see you know, how high is it pulling up. And at the last minute, once the balloon has the lift that we want it to and we tie it off, we start the cameras because we want to make sure they're not going to run out of memory. So we start them at the last minute. Um, and then we attach the payload to the balloon and we launch it. And after we let go of the balloon, starts the chase. And we have a bunch of chase vehicles equipped with radios, GPS, and computers. And some examples of the mapping software, oops, sorry about that. Some examples of the map meeting software we use are APRS Point, WinAPRS, and UIView, although there are some other options out there. The one that I usually use is APRS Point, and we have to configure those to receive on the correct frequency, the APRS frequency, and we keep track of the balloon that way, and it shows up on the map on the computer screen. And we usually have a navigator sitting in the passenger seat telling the driver, okay, the balloon's going this way, these are the roads you need to take. Once the balloon lands, we aren't always there to see it land, although my group has been there a couple of times to see it land, which is really cool. But if we're not there to see it land, we have to figure out where it is. If it's in the woods or somewhere, we have to you know, work our way back there and find it. Uh, sometimes the packages don't always land where we want them to. Like I said with the prediction, we want them to land in the, the fields, the pastures, the farms. But we have had them land in dense woods, tall trees, neighborhoods, and swamps. And we tend to get uh, muddy and wet when they land in the swamp type areas, which has happened on multiple occasions. And this, sometimes a recovery we will cry a chainsaw or waders, which sounds extreme, but it happens. And it often takes longer to recover the, the payloads than it does to even launch them and, and uh, go through with the chase. So these are some pictures of recovery, just because recovery is usually the most fun part of the balloon mission. This picture up here is one of the most recent missions, and you can see my in my dad's shadow. And this was in a huge grassy field, and when the balloon landed, these payloads decided to find the smallest little puddle of water and land right in it. There was like no water for, for miles, and it found the only little sliver of water, and it landed there. On one of the other missions, I wasn't uh, in one of these shoes, thankfully, but uh, it landed in a very muddy uh, region. It was actually raining that day, and we launched it in the rain anyway. And when they went to recover, they all got very muddy. That one up there is one of the nice ones that we had. It landed in a field just like we wanted it to, and we just had to walk out there. We had to ask the farmer, okay. And then we went out there and just got picked it up, and it was very easy. And this one uh, is another one that landed kind of in a marsh, and it was gross. And as you can see, we were trying to maneuver around without getting wet, but that was very difficult. And so we were passing there that that they're passing back and forth is one of the antennas that was transmitting. Um, and I think it was actually still transmitting. That's not recommended. Um, <laughs> So uh, after I've spent a lot of time with the program at my school, actually on de Saturday, December 17th this past year at 12.17 p.m., I was notified of my acceptance into the MIT's class of 2016, and it was very exciting. MIT uh, traditionally sends out their acceptance letters in these tubes. You can see mine right there. And it's, you know, it's really cool to just get a tube in the mail. It's very uh, unique. Um, so this year, 
as a like a new tradition, they wanted us to hack our tubes. And at MIT, they have a tradition called hacking. And hacking can be uh, doing pranks or practical jokes, but generally it's just doing something really cool. One of the most well-known hacks is putting things on top of the Great Dome, putting cars up there, painting it like R2-D2. It's very cool. But to hack my tube, I decided to send it to near space. And uh, it, was, it gained actually a lot of publicity that I wasn't expecting uh, when I did this. So the flight equipment that I used for this uh, flight was a donated balloon from my teacher who does the program at my school. And I had this tube and I had some insulating foam, which you can see um, in there if you come up after the presentation. And uh, we had some homemade antennas, which I brought as well. And we actually just you know, tuned them, made them all from scratch. And one of them is actually wrapped around a, uh, a cross-stitching hoop because we found that that design is very effective for balloon launches. We borrowed a parachute and we used my mom's GoPro Hero camera and it was actually the first time that it had been used. She got it for Christmas and I did this launch in January. So uh, it was the first time it was used. Thankfully we recovered it and it worked very well. And we had two APRS systems as our tracking and one of them was an Argent Data Open Tracker Plus that I built and that was transmitting with a Baofeng UV3R radio and a Garmin Legend GPS. The second one we had, I actually borrowed from a friend as well, was a Bionics Pocket Tracker that's in one of those Altoids 10s. And we had those transmitting with my frequency, my call sign and my dad's call sign. And it was, it was very cool. I didn't fly any experiments on this one though, uh, because it was a very small package compared to what I'm used to with my school. And it was just basically a fun thing. It was the first time that I had run a launch basically on my own instead of with a team. So I tried to keep it simple. Um, so for the ground equipment, we actually borrowed the helium regulator that my group at my school uses. We didn't buy a new one because those are expensive. Um, and we used in the ground station in my vehicle, or in our vehicle, we had a Kenwood D710 with the built-in TNC, a Garmin new GPS, and that was using a sound card interface called the Signalink USB to communicate with a netbook, which was running GPS gate to interpret NMEA statements from the new and AGW package engine and APRS point. So as you can see, our setup is actually a lot more software intensive than some people. Some people have a separate TNC and a specific GPS for the radio and uh, they don't have the AGW packet engine that kind of makes it so you don't need that in between. Testing as well, if we have some new equipment with new batteries, we want to make sure that they will be able to survive. So we do dry ice testing and that takes, you know, it takes several weeks to prepare for uh, one of these launches. But, um, I don't know. We have logged it, but I can't remember. Uh, it's very cold though. It's actually kind of interesting. It's exposed to more radiation, but because it's not, you know, it doesn't have the atmosphere keeping it warm, it's cold. Um, so it's kind of strange mixture, but it's it's very extreme uh, environment. I would ask you, how did you get started? What profit did you get? I got started with this because basically when I was a freshman in high school and I'm about to graduate next week, um, when I was a freshman I would, like didn't really know what I wanted to do. I went in and looked at all the, like, the options of extracurriculars and one of them that they had listed was called the space program and I thought that sounded really cool and so I joined it and this is what they did and that's how I got involved in ham radio too. Uh, we know because the GPS is logging the uh, altitude, but we actually uh, can sometimes, if maybe it loses the altitude, we can do a prediction based on the uh, previous altitudes, like the ascent rate. Uh, and when we plug it into the prediction, we kind of have to guess like what altitude is going to pop at. But it's usually pretty uh, consistent if you have a certain size balloon with a certain weight of the payload. This one was around 90,000 feet, uh, but some of the ones we've flown in the past were like 85,000. And if you have a really big balloon, it can go up to like 100, 110,000 feet. Uh, 
Um, the balloon, like, it starts out smaller, like you saw when we were filling it up, but it expands to be, I don't know, maybe from this wall to that little yellow wall over there. It's huge um, because these weather balloons are very, very uh, elastic. Um, and this this one, like I said, was a, around 90,000 feet. So. Mm. I'm sorry. It's all right. Was your dad a radio operator before? Or did we actually dad? got our licenses at the same time, on the same day. Mm -hmm. um, if you're starting from scratch, I would estimate that like preparing everything, getting all the equipment, might cost around a thousand dollars. But we usually borrow equipment. We use stuff that my teacher has laying around from past launches. I don't know how much the balloons cost though, because he always buys them in bulk. So I, I have no idea what the price range is for those. But we have to rent the gas, which is around eighty dollars for like a certain amount of time that you rent it. If you forget to return it, then it costs more. Um, and we had that. Um, and then all the equipment, like usually people will have some of the stuff already, uh, but you don't know how much you have, so that's an estimate. Okay, yeah, 